Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We're so excited you could join us today, some of you in person and some of you online, for On Rewriting the Story of Black Women's Bodies. My name is Alex Elliott. I'm the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, which if you do not know, is a nonprofit university here in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIS public programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramaytush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Tonight's conversation is being live streamed to our online audience and also recorded for our podcast, which allows us to provide accessible content to a wider audience. If any of you would like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available starting later this evening on the CIIS Public Programs YouTube channel. And we're also going to feature this conversation uh, on our podcast in the future with an accompanying transcript. You can find that at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. We are gonna be having a live Q&A for those of you in the room and those of you watching live online. You can post your questions at any time. If you're online, you can use that web form that's linked just below the video. And for those of you in the room, there are signs on the back of some of these seats with a QR code. Um, too much to say. Uh, that will link to that same form so that everybody's submitting in the same place. If you don't have a device with you or you'd prefer to write your question by hand, we do have cards that we can uh, hand to you if you kind of wave in our general direction. Um, we'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for this evening. Now, before we get started, um, I'm going to introduce our presenters, Jessica and Danielle, and then we will get right to their conversation. Danielle Drake is Dean of Faculty Development, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at CIIS. Dr. Drake is also an Associate Professor and former Chair of the Counseling Psychology Expressive Arts Therapy MA program. She earned her PhD in Clinical Psychology from Fielding Graduate University with her dissertation study focused on the use of creativity and spirituality among African Americans. As a mental health therapist at Rafiki Coalition, Dr. Drake focuses on holistic health and psycho-spiritual wellness of clients in the Bayview-Hunters Point community of San Francisco. Dr. Drake's clinical work as an expressive arts therapist engages clients individually and, in, and groups in creative writing, music, and visual arts processes. As a spoken word artist, Dr. Drake is a former Oakland Poetry Slam champion and author of Cast Iron Life, a collection of poems and recipes. Jessica Wilson is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and a consultant activist, centering the voices and experiences of those most marginalized in the eating disorder field. She's the co-founder of the hashtag Amplify Melanated Voices movement to elevate content creators, including dietitians, therapists, and body liberation advocates who are Black, Indigenous, or other people of color. With more than 120,000 followers, her Instagram has become a clearinghouse for unpacking racist and damaging conceptions about food and bodies. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Jessica and Danielle. All right. Sound working good? Yes. All right. We are here. And it is um, a pleasure to be here. I was just talking earlier that this is one of the first few in-person conversations we've had um, in this iteration of the pandemic. I'm saying we're trans pandemic. <laughs> so it's, I'm really, really happy to have you here 
and to have this conversation today. I'm so glad to talk to you. Do yeah. you mind if we start with our pronouns? Sure. So I'm Jessica Wilson. I use she, her pronouns. And <laughs> I'm Danielle Drake, and I use she, her, joyful. I love that so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a reminder. It's a reminder for me. It's a reminder for others, I think, that um, joy is a choice in a lot of ways. We can talk more about that. I have some thoughts that mm -hmm. you actually articulate pretty well in your book. <laughs> so um, let's jump in. Yeah, let's. Um, so the first question that I have is really just about like, what was the impetus for writing this book? And I'm interested in the title too. It's always been ours. There's two answers to yes. the impetus for writing the book. Okay. Two of them are actually in this audience. I said no to writing this book from Renee, who is right here, uh, multiple <laughs> times. Do you want to write a book? No. <laughs> How about now? No. Uh, so, and then I talked to my friend Shana, who actually is across from Renee, uh, and said, uh, if I can reach a group of people rather than just my one on one uh, appointments with folks, then it would be worth it to write a book. So here we are. Good answer, Shayna. <laughs> <laughs> um, the title, I honestly can't remember where it came from. I want to say it was one of the initial pitches mm -hmm. for the book. And since it's come out and after reading it throughout um, and talking with friends, I've just realized how much has always been ours. It's not just like it as a body narrative. Mm -hmm. It's joy. It's so many things that have really always been ours that we've either known or have perhaps been taken from us mm -hmm. that we need to reclaim. Yeah, yeah, I can um, absolutely understand that. And especially as, I mean, this book is centered for Black women, Black femmes, and um, so much of you know our legacy is about um, being taken, taken from, all of that. And so um, to talk about it, even from a joyful resistance place, I think is a, is a big piece, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's what you, what you said you wanted to focus on too. <laughs> joy tonight, you, you said, um, joy at CIIS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really feel that in 2023, that joy has been missing and we need a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of things always being hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to laugh. Mm -hmm. I want to be in community and yes, express and experience joy. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, this question that I'm um, going to ask you is kind of off script because I didn't even think about it until I was in the back there okay. and I was listening to your um, bio and you, they, um, you are, they said, an eating disorder specialist. And mm -hmm. I'm always interested in the word disorder. Yeah. Because um, as, a, as a clinician, mm -hmm. we're supposed to diagnose, we're supposed to do all of these things. And it leads us in, down a path of pathology. And so I just, you know, want you to speak maybe a little bit about, you know, eating as a disorder. And, um, you know, how we can bring some joy there. <laughs> <laughs> so many ways to answer that question. Just like flow with it. <laughs> no. I'll start at the beginning or where you started, okay. which is the pathologizing. And I think also problematizing of yes. our eating disorder mm -hmm. uh, in quotation marks. And often and so often black women, black folks just will never fit within the confines of a diagnosis because the medical industrial complex is just not created to include us in the first place. Um, so I write that, you know, for anorexia or bulimia um, diagnoses that black folks just often don't fit into those categories based on our presentation and we're not seen or assumed to have mm -hmm. an eating quote disorder. So what are we doing when we're talking about and using the word disorder? Yeah. Yeah. So how can we talk about food in a way that actually applies and makes sense? And how can we talk about 
the ways that we restrict or eat in ways that offer joy, also survival, sometimes respectability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate that. And it makes me think about, um, you know, the, the sort of pathology that is inside of, or, or what is the supposed pathology inside of a disorder. And it's really mm -hmm. just communication, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> People are communicating about something and it's usually something that is not right. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and they don't have necessarily the microphone mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to um, talk about it, you know? It's a good point. I like it. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that I noticed in the book is that you took sort of a qualitative narrative approach to um, the structure of the book, you know, this storytelling approach. And I just want you to talk for a little bit about why that was important specifically for engaging a discussion about, um, you know, Black women and femme bodies. Yeah. So 10 parts to that I'll focus on too. Um, <laughs> I've been told that I exist in conversation. I exist in community. And also it's in more fun and digestible read when it is more of a conversation and not just a string of facts. So for to demonstrate what it is like to be in community. I think I've infused a lot in here. And again, the confines of white supremacy and medicine, black women, black folks are actually never included or centered in that. So using a quantitative lens is literally impossible because we're not in the research. We have been historically the research. So yeah, qualitative. Yeah. Conversational. Yeah. And, you know, it was interesting because when I was thinking about it, I was like, of course, it would it can only be that it can only be that because, um, you know, just coming from like a womanist perspective, it's about self-definition. And the only way you get to self-define mm -hmm. is to tell the story. Yeah. You know, and it's and it's usually so much more nuanced and complex than um, what the health industrial or medical industrial complex wants to be able to see, mm -hmm. um, especially for, you know, folks that, ha you know, sit outside of the normal um, population yeah. that they use to create all of the guidelines and standards, mm -hmm. i.e. BMI, the, all of, all of the things, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you also took some time to detail some specific definitions about health and wellness and all of that. Um, and, you know, you, you make distinctions between like big H health mm -hmm. and little H health, yeah. big W wellness, mm -hmm. little W wellness. Can you take me through, um, you know, not just what it, like what, what the definitions are, but like maybe a couple of, of examples about like why that's important. Yeah. Uh, big or capital H health to me is the social construction of health, the series of agreements that we all have about what health is, what health looks like. We like to think that it's objective, that, you know, it's about numbers and values and labs and things, but it's not. Um, it is about what, you know, we have been told, which is oftentimes everything that Blackness and Black women are not, is what is capital H health. And it's also, you know, looks a certain way. So even if things look great on paper, but if you don't look healthy for one reason or another, um, you still won't have it. And then, so in that case, like lowercase health might be the way that I'm feeling, mm -hmm. um, might be the way that I'm interacting with folks, but it's, you know, an individual again. Wellness, I love capital W wellness. It's like the wellness industrial complex again. It is goop, it is dust, it's adaptogens, it's vagina candles. Wait a minute, that chapter? Yeah. I was like, 
Absolutely not. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know that it this I didn't read it until after our conversation, mm-hmm. our, our initial conversation. I was like, well, she told me to read this chapter, so I'm gonna read it. And I'm literally two lines in. I felt like my body tightened and I was like, this is, you know, it's that moment when you are a person of color going into a white space Mm -hmm. and you're like, this ain't gonna be right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it was literally that. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm reading through the chapter. And in a way, like I get it. I get what you were trying to do. It was like this experiment, Mm -hmm. right? Um, so talk talk to the audience about the, the experiment of goo. <laughs> so I was months into writing and really hadn't experienced wellness and all it had to offer. To me, it had been, you know, through clients that had told me they had gone down their wellness journey or they had started taking some dust or whatever it was. Um, and I was wondering how I could get a good experience with wellness in a short period of time. So I went right to Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow and said, what she, what can she offer me? I wasn't going to do a cleanse or anything like that because that's silly. But instead, she was having a uh, one-day event, her in Goop Health Summit, um, and that was at the Porsche Driving Experience um, <laughs> Sponsored by Porsche, a part a part of it was to drive in a Porsche for a spiritual experience of yes, a mind body connection, um, <laughs> a spiritual yeah, you know, mind body con- experience, right? Okay, uh, I always say, and my one of my favorite parts of it, you know, it was just this like weird two things happening at once, and in you know meditation, it was like feet, you know, your feet flat on the the ground and I was like this is a driveway this is just really yeah it was it was a lot the 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 guided visualization took me out I was like no no oh absolutely we're gonna have a guided visualization about driving a (laughs) port oh yes uh you don't have to care for people around you it's not just an individual experience yeah you're looking out for others um yeah it was it was something um the food offerings at breakfast but uh, like you already mentioned, you know, if I had been wearing all black, somebody would have asked me where the bathroom was because it was me and maybe two other black women that I can recall. Um, the whole sea of like long past your shoulder, like blonde and brown hair from, I'd have a picture of the entire event. And that is just all that it is in wellness Disneyland, um, where we got to try. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, but I say it was like this beautiful, easeful time. Like they let me in to like what it meant to be a rich white woman. Like I really got to experience this Disneyland, this paradise of just being carefree for a day. I was like, I get it. I see this. Mm-hmm. Um, I could honestly pay enough money and get into this, but no, I, I did not. Um, and then I, we left with like a thousand to two thousand dollars worth of swag um yeah wow okay Gwyneth's own vibrator came in the in the back I just don't even know that I would want that (laughs) (laughs) I love free things I love free things but um yeah it it was surprising and the audience was so clear Mm -hmm. to the speakers and what they were saying it was like wow this is just not my reality Mm -hmm. at all the things that you were talking about and that the ways that you're trying to be relatable they're just Mm -hmm. not to me and my yeah life and you know I hope I'm that this is okay because it's in the book so you know we'll talk about it but the way that your body responded Mm -hmm. to it I thought was the most telling thing because it was like this is not right we need to shut down Mm -hmm. and just like reject all of what's happening. Oh, the metaphor there. Look at that. Wow. Yes. Um, And also what I hadn't realized until really recently. So the story goes that Goop was just a day, but I was very dedicated to the whole wellness experience. So we went to LA for two, two nights total. Uh, Gwyneth has her own like guide to wellness in LA uh, map So we, you know, got that. We traveled through LA. We got, yeah, we got the dust from Moon Juice. Um, We went to like clean 
a clean cafe where there were ridiculous options, including a bariatric smoothie, um, you know, spelled like a berry, of course. <laughs> um, and, you know, a bunch of things you could use to clean yourself out if you needed to do so. But I had forgotten actually that night, that first night, I did, I had one seizure then and I totally completely forgot about it. Mm -hmm. So the first night after having all the dusts, I had a seizure. Oh, sorry, I should start over. I have epilepsy. That seizure was not out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I've had seizures for 30 years um, and they've been finely controlled. I have maybe like one, one a month um, on average. And so I had one that night, which is like, oh, I have one. That's mm -hmm. fine. Next day was Wellness Disneyland, uh, where I also had many dust, many mushrooms, and got a B12 injection into my hip because I was all in. Um, it was a very red vial. I was like, oh, maybe it's like a beetroot shot that you know, like literally mm -hmm. shoot into your mouth. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought it was. No, you could pull down, you know, your pants and. And I was all in. So of course I was going to do that amongst um, all of the other things that I did. And yes, so the next day I woke up with the worst seizure flare that I have had in all of the 30 years. Um, I don't remember the next, I remember the next morning because I was still committed and went to a soul cycle class, the first one I've ever been to. Um, and I was dedicated to that. And then I don't remember anything after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, my body said no to wellness Disneyland entirely. I hadn't put those together, rejected it. Yeah, your body was clearly speaking. And I was, and the whole time I was like, for me, it, it also was about the immersion of you mm -hmm. in not just wellness Disneyland, but like wellness as defined by whiteness. Yeah. And that that's what it was mm -hmm. because it didn't allow for any other you know, um, definitions or um, expressions, demonstrations of wellness that stood outside of whatever, mm -hmm. you know, wellness is, is sort of, you know, co-opted to be at this moment. Mm -hmm. So they had folks of color doing the workshops. Um, the initial black woman did the, your feet on the Porsche uh, meditation, right? So like, you can see that there was like the sprinkling of color people needed to go for in 2022. They were like, we've been paying attention. Let's have a black person talk to us about a Porsche um, <laughs> meditation. Um, there was a very flamboyant man telling us about creativity um, and, you know, hearkening to Elon Musk and his creativity. <laughs> like okay um and then other folks there was somebody who talked about relationships that was fine um that that was fine relationships but yeah it was not for me yeah turns out <laughs> turns out it yeah. wasn't for you absolutely and so um what you've been doing though um in your own work is i think um really important because you've been um for in your career, really looking at um, the way that um, food and eating and all of that is sort of looked at by this this profession of being um, a dietitian, and then you know figuring out alternative ways to you know work with folks and all of that. And um, I had a question that I wanted to ask. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about some of the, the narratives in, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit about the narrative about the, the, um, the, the student who was an engineer, Mia, Mia yeah. and then also the gymnast. Lexi. Lexi. Yeah. So um, in both of those narratives, um, and they're both Black women, um, both like immersed in um, a world that is not really built for them, not right? Not at all, yeah. Not at all built for them. Um, you know, we don't have to talk about gymnasts. We already know that that's a, a whole world of peril. But the but the woman who um, was training to be an engineer, mm -hmm. um, and just can you just share a little bit about that story, um, and we can talk about you know yeah. So 
I was at a predominantly white institution for actually many collegiate years um, as a dietitian on a college campus. So I ended up working with a lot of students, grad students, and one in particular was sent to me um, because her physician had seen her lab results and was like, I'm concerned there's something going on here. Um, go talk to the dietitian. And she was like, cool, because my hair is falling out. I need to know what supplements that I'm going to need to take in order to figure this out. Jessica, how can you help me? What supplements do I need to take? And I was like, oh, okay. That's the conversation that you're willing to have. Um, and that was not the primary concern. So Mia is uh, the client. She was in an all white uh, graduate program and already as a black woman was hyper visible yet invisible to everyone around her. And so when she went on her own wellness journey and ended up losing weight, she became, you know, visible, more visible and people and more palatable and people started talking to her. So she wasn't hyper visible. She was more easily seen um, and was getting the benefits of that, which was more social capital, more friends um, in her program at the expense of her physical and mental well-being. So her body was starting to eat itself and her hair, as you heard, was falling out. Um, her mental um, health and her family relationships were slowly unraveling. Um, and so we had a real conversation about what, you know, eating more, and I won't say because again, the pathologizing, mm -hmm. yeah, and what a disorder is, but like what would eating more look like? And, you know, it wasn't an option because, you know, being seen, getting a job, you know, having good references is important when, you know, you're a black professional. And, you know, she was open to reading Fearing the Black Body, a uh, excellent 400 page book by Dr. Sabrina Strings, highly recommend. Um, she was open to reading it and totally understood me when we talked about white supremacy and the ways that black women's bodies are viewed and treated. And she said, yes, I understand. And like, I appreciate what you're telling me you are right. And that's not something that I'm going to, I, I can't eat more food right now. And, you know, as a dietitian, you know, you're supposed to solve problems and convince people to recover from their disorder. And that's not at all what was going on mm -hmm. right there. She was, you know, she didn't have an eating disorder. She had found a survival strategy. Yeah, it was, it was literally the line that has stayed with me was, I can't be black and fat. And that just, it just broke my heart, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. no space, none. <clears throat> and then she was equating it to every, like her weight was equated to every like measure of success she could have. So it was like, you know, being able to have, um, be fit in, mm -hmm like for study groups yeah. to have network afterwards that if she were these two things, black and fat, that she would not be able to have any of those. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just real, <laughs> real, real hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and, and that the messages of, um, you know, white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism had just like, gotten into her bones yeah and 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 she was like for my survival mm -hmm. this is what I have to do yeah we had the conversations um I was like oh do you know of any older folks in your profession who are fat black women I'd be like yes absolutely and I was like how are their you know how's her career going and she's like it's fine now but they got into the profession and so her assumption was you know they had done the same things that she had done they had had you know shrunk their bodies at the time but like now they're established and they're able to be comfortable um being fat and black but you know it just wasn't an option she saw 
the dichotomies and the dissonance there, but yeah. And the reality is that people treat you differently. Yep. People treat you differently when you um, conform to, you know, mm -hmm. whatever the standard is. Yeah. Um, I remember working at a at a at a substance abuse clinic, mm -hmm. and I had a particular client. And she was just, you know, doing well. We were working her program the way she wanted to work it. And it was working. And then, you know, had a relapse. And um, she started losing all of this weight. Mm -hmm. And everybody was like, oh, you look great. You look great. And I was just like, oh, don't say that to her. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, because I knew that it was it was based in all of the things, you know, that we've been talking about so far. And she was actually the least healthy that she had been since I started seeing her. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, it is um, terrifying what people will do to their bodies in order to, you know, fit into, you know, these standards. Yeah. yeah. I had a patient who lost weight because she had cancer. And she got such positive feedback from people who didn't know she had cancer. Mm -hmm. She didn't have an eating disorder beforehand, but after her cancer recovery, she said, you know, I can't give this up. You know, I can't regain the weight that I lost through cancer. Mm -hmm. And so ended up working um, in our eating disorder program. And we had to talk about, you know, all of the myths of, you know, sugar and all, <laughs> any carbohydrate and all of these things that people find on the internet when they're searching for answers and mm -hmm. when society is just trash. It's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think this is a good segue into um, a question that I wanted to ask um, about um, just the ideas that you share in the book align with the size, diversity, and inclusion conversations that are just beginning to happen more publicly here at CIIS. Um, I, I, this is really important to me just because I've been around this, this, um, thank you. I've been around this um, environment, this, this institution, this community um, since 20, no, 2008. Mm -hmm. Um, first as a student, all, all the things, <laughs> I've held all the positions. And um, I remember specifically having to work very hard internally mm. to make sure that I did not ever like allow this place full of like thin white yoga bodies. Yeah you know, oh, yeah. to, to see myself represented. So I would walk down the halls and never encounter anybody who looked like me, size, shape, color, nothing. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, it was a real journey for me. And so I think that, you know, there are people now here at this school who are really like, you know, I'm, I, I, I want this to be a part of our conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be a part of the conversation. Um, so just, you know, can you speak about your choice to join some of the size inclusive um, diet? What, do, what, what's the right term <laughs> that, that you were using that that are that's out there in the community. So like the health at every size community? That's health at every size. Okay. I love that. Okay. Yes. Um, let's talk about that. H how you made the choice to sort of join those groups earlier in your career. So that's the first part. Okay. And then the second part is, um, you know, you talk about ways that size inclusivity can be implemented in both individual conversations and then larger systems like CIIS. Okay, you'll have to remind me of that. I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll go back. Okay. <laughs> I can go into, yeah, specifics about therapists, but yeah. you'll have to remind me again. Um, I got into those uh, community groups when I was still working um, at the University of Oregon because we were seeing uh, average sized, overweight, and obese patients with anorexia and we're like oh no like this is not in the textbooks what do we do we know nothing as a treatment team um i need to learn about the science that is out there with the 
like weight science is what we'll call it. But the idea that weight is uh, linked to, um, let's see, how should I put it? Disconnecting health from weight. So the size of our bodies, our weight does not have a direct impact on our health or what health looks like for us. Um, and in those communities, um, it was a bunch of middle-aged baby boomer at the time, uh, fat white women. And they were having conversations that were incredibly second wave feminism. Um, so it was a, how do we get ourselves to be treated like thin white women when we go to the doctor's office? And I said, hey, <laughs> what about other things that are going on in doctor's offices other than you know weight stigma and fat phobia here because my friends who are fat that i'm talking to now when they go to the doctor even if they're treated like thin people they're still black they're still disabled they're still trans um so what conversations do we need to be having that are different than the ones that are being had here so that was like my my like into health at every size. I helped them rewrite their principles in 2014. You were like, hey, you know, black person have a seat at a literal table or think tank. Um, we need you in diversity and social justice was the term at that time. It was before intersectionality. Mm -hmm. So it was like, we need these social justice words literally in our principles and, you know, foolish me <laughs> thinking that the words in there would mean something, but it was business as usual. So I had to say, you know, goodbye then. Mm -hmm. um, so now, yay for uh, different organizations that are outside. So the Association for Size, Diversity and Health is one who owns the Health at Every Size principles, but then there are rad fat organizations mm -hmm. like No Lose. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll shout out and people have questions about Yes, no I, I please shout out all the, the <laughs> resources and groups and all of that, because this is really about, you know, I think um, just the act of joyfulness, right? Yeah. How do we joyfully love ourselves regardless, mm -hmm. you know? I do. So yes, other organizations that are doing more body liberation, fat liberation work mm -hmm. that are less tied to health. So that was something else that was going on yeah. within health at every size is just the direct tie to health and the healthism that is inherent when you're trying to, you know, prove that your body size is worthy because it's healthy, which was what was happening there. Mm -hmm. So how do we uncouple those things still and just be fine? Mm -hmm at whatever, you know, body size. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, in the book, you were talking about going to some uh, talk or workshop or conference with, with some doctor and they were like, no, that doesn't happen. People oh, who yeah. are anorexic do, you know, they're, they're not large people. They're thin. They're, they're very thin. skin. Yeah. They're very thin. What the patients that you have like you don't have sick patients was the message. Like you don't actually have patients with eating disorders. And then we were stuck. So yeah, I had to look for other communities. And that is the um, sort of uh, gaslighting yeah. that happens um, for a lot of people who show up in health spaces, medical spaces, whatever. They can see you having a perfectly healthy experience and, and, and name you unhealthy. Yeah. Um, I recently, um, in 2021, delivered a two-year-old. Well, now I didn't deliver a two-year-old. <laughs> Come on now. No, but he's two now. But um, I delivered a baby in 2021, mm -hmm. very unexpectedly. Um, uh, got pregnant during the pandemic, pandemic baby, because that's what everybody did. <laughs> but... Um, the thing is, I had a healthy pregnancy. And at one point, my uh, OB said, oh, well, you're having a really boring pregnancy. And I'm like, as opposed to what, you know? And they tried to make me unhealthy the entire pregnancy because of my age, my race, and my weight. So because of all of these like external factors, I was like, no one ever like gave me a survey or, you know, um, asked me what my stress levels were like or anything. They just assumed that I was stressed out. I was on the verge of like, you know, preeclampsia and gestational diabetes, none of which would happen or was a problem, anything like that. And then two weeks before, um, 
my delivery, they sort of doubled down and double teamed me while on a non-stress test, you know, uh, requesting that I do a an induction. So I had to fight, fight, fight for two weeks before the delivery. And then finally had a natural delivery, preg you know, labor, all of that. Two pushes, by the way, I'm like super excited about that. You know, and I and, and for me and my doula, my doula was in the room and she was like, yeah, you know, because she was my advocate throughout the whole thing, telling me, Danielle, you are healthy. You are healthy. This baby is healthy and we are not going to do we're not thinking about anything else. And um, so shout out to some Sarah Morgan. <laughs> but but. I think it's that it's 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 the ways in which a person can be either demonstrating, you know, some problem. I don't even want to call it a problem, but just like demonstrating um, behaviors that are trying to communicate, right? Like in the in the in the case of um, the clients that you were having, where there it mystifies the doctors, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They're larger, but they have anorexic, you know, behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. There's that piece. Or then you have people who might be heavy and are just perfectly healthy. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with them. But because of the structures that are created. Yeah, people become risk factors. Right. So I think like you as a person were a risk factor. There was, it was boring otherwise, but because of everything that the doctor saw on paper and in person. They were like, mm. like we are worried because everything you have going on, you know, means that you're inherently a risk factor. Mm -hmm. But it was boring. Yeah. Just the just your body, the way that you show up, um, especially as black women. We just are like, according to all of the the science, mm -hmm. we are a health risk just by being yes. mm -hmm. our very being. And so to um to push for um an acknowledgement of our of our health of our wellness um in these larger spaces which we have to be in you know yeah. um because right. there's there's very few alternatives and especially if you you know um are um have lower income and sort of are reliant on these structures and these systems for your well-being, mm -hmm. you have to go into these places. You have to be seen by these people. And so, you know, what are the ways that, you know, from your from your uh, perspective in your field, what are the ways that people can, I don't know, just find and I, I think this goes back to the question that, that yeah. I was asking before, you know, how can, how can people like find a sense of, of, of joy, but then also really have what is necessary for them, mm -hmm. um, both individually and collectively, you know, individually, like one-on-one -on -one when we're having conversations with medical pro professionals, but then also in the larger systems, how can we affect those systems? Yeah. Can I answer the therapist one first? Because I've been trying really hard. Yeah. Okay, because this is therapy here. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Uh, so for therapists, I always think of the tendency to join our clients, not our clients. I don't want to say your because it feels rude. Mm -hmm. uh, to join clients, we'll just say that, in their distress. And when that's about weight, right, to just easily, like, join in, you know, internalized fat phobia and, you know, talk about their weight as a problem. So if that's, you know, one thing that could be different is not joining a client and like reinforcing their own internalized fat phobia would be one and recognizing, of course, the systems and structures that go along with those. So that's just a <laughs> therapist plug. Um, and then for those of us and who have to interact with uh, medical systems, I have with a dear friend, a black friend, also with a chronic illness. Um, a lot of our text thread is like, what happened to you at the doctor's appointment today? Um, how did it go getting your prescription? Um, yeah, what nonsense did you have to put up with um, at 
you know, so finding community, I have been, I have found to be essential. Uh, disability community for me, like changed my life. Um, all of my internalized ableism, like overflow with. <laughs> um, I have a seizure disorder, so I can't drive. Um, and so rely on my legs or someone to get anywhere and everywhere. Um, and so, you know, what would be a five minute errand, you know, either for me is, you know, loop over lift or like 20 minutes of bike ride. So having and asking, you know, was one of my primary, like needing help <laughs> as a black woman and somebody with a chronic illness was like impossible. Like compounded. Yeah. As, like the whole needing help yep. just generally as yes. a black woman. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. and then having um, your to ask to literally get help yeah. like all the time. Yes. Yeah. Um, so having community of folks who understand experiences, um, I talk about resilience and how it can literally kill us, but like how can community build that resilience in another way? So we become resilient. We are not performing uh, resilience for white supremacy. So having that community there, um, there are some networks of folks um, who have, you know, names of doctors who are more um, fat friendly uh, providers and people who can advocate. Mm -hmm. um, but that's really hard to find, especially if you don't get to pick and choose who your provider is. Mm -hmm. um, self advocacy is one option. I struggle with that because that like puts the um, the responsibility on the individual, mm -hmm. which I don't love. Um, but when it comes to just you know, medical, medical health. There are some resources, health at every size does have health sheets. So you can learn about, you know, your body and your health. When you go to the doctor, you can have, you know, these key terms. Um, but one also I always recommend, especially for, you know, fat folks and trans patients is to have somebody else go with you who will make eye contact with the doctor when the doctor won't make eye contact with the patient or, you know, advocating, for some having somebody who will advocate for you mm -hmm. or do the yelling into the phone that you know people shouldn't have to do mm -hmm. so those are some yeah well and it just sounds like um really the antidote to everything which is community <laughs> <laughs> having people <laughs> yes. people um and you know relationships and people who um you who are your people, Yeah, people who are your people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this is something that I, um, want to talk about. Cause I think you get to it in like the, um, latter, like third of the book is, which is really about like, well, what can we do? Mm -hmm. You know? So I feel like we're already, um, entering into that territory, but um, centering Blackness. That's what I really want to talk about. <laughs> centering Blackness. And, and um, you talked about it a little bit um, um, in the book. I'm trying to remember what the context was, but I, I feel like it's just everywhere and in everything. Um, it's become a focal point for many Black women, film activists, scholars. Um, we think about Trisha Hersey and the NAP Ministry, Black Women of God, uh, Black Woman is God Project in, um, here in the Bay Area. How can this type of perspective um, be incorporated into the discussion of health and wellness to engage more joy? Those are so many questions right there. Yeah. How can it be to engage more? <laughs> Uh, oh, it's that too. Um, I feel that every boardroom needs a black woman laughing loudly. Um, mm. That was, <laughs> uh, at least one, if not ten. Uh, so that would be centering blackness and joy and black joy all at the same time. <laughs> um, and um, you, so center. It's becoming, I'm hoping, it's mm. becoming apparent how much is missing when white folks are talking about health and wellness. You know, I can think of one particular that might be familiar here. There's a podcast that is Maintenance Phase, which has a lot of great facts, but it is very white. Um, it is very of those white- Maintenance homes. Phase. Yeah. So it's like, 
you know, when you're thinking about recovery. <laughs> no, it, yeah, that, it's and it gets it's, to like the maintenance. It's phase by a white fat activist and okay. a thin gay guy who thinks he's knows all about fat people and okay. sometimes speaks for them, but it's fine. Um, it's actually not fine. But they, you know, talk about you know health fads and trends and like why you know this diet didn't work or why it's silly or this diet book. But it is, you know. Saying that it's not intersectional is really simple. There's no complexity there. It is like, what is on paper? Like what was written? There's no like greater impact or societal impact or how this intersects. They talk about poverty some, but like really white supremacy and how this impacts people who are not white and privileged mm -hmm. is really missing. And so people walk away thinking they learned something, which they might have, but then consider that good enough. Like I have learned about fatness. I have learned about how diets don't work and like checkbox, you know? Mm -hmm. And then there's no like need to go and find more information is how I experience it. Um, and so having hiring, having black folks doing all of the talking would be great. Um, and there are folks who are black, especially in the eating disorder field, who play the game of whiteness very well and don't question what they've been told. And if we had more radical black folks who were unapologetic in our joy, you know, at these, in these organizations at these tables, I really feel like things would be so much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But black joy. Yeah. Yes. What's uh? Tell me about your pronouns. You want to talk to me about yeah, my pronouns? I again? do. Okay. Well, this is actually a good moment. I think. Um, I don't know when it came to me. It just was like, yeah, this is it, and um, and I'm not gonna do anything. Um, certainly, I think. Um, I have been. Um really looking at joy as my, my resistance um, probably for about 10 years, like before we got to like the whole black joy mm -hmm. parade and the thing that happened a couple of weeks ago, shout out black joy parade. Um, but it was really just about, um, I know what it was. I was encountering a lot of folks who um, were called, you know, who are activists, but I feel like the way that activism is sort of packaged, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, of othering and canceling and, um, you know, I believe in righteous anger, like I do, but it, it often wouldn't go anywhere because it wasn't about collaboration or trying to, you know, see where things could go. And so I was just like, you know, there has to be a, a more effective way to do this. How can we engage like empathy and joy and hold people accountable, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so that for me was it, I was like, because I'm in a space of being um, an activist and I like to call myself um, a, a teacherist, maybe, just because it was sort of the same reason why you were um, sort of pushed to um, write the book, which is why I was like, shout out, Shana. Was that correct? <laughs> yeah. Going back to you. Um, I, I feel like what we're talking about really is just this opportunity to um, be in front of more people, affect more people. And I did have one of my mentors say, you know, um, that she decided not to be a therapist, although I do love therapy and I'm a therapist and I, lo I, I love my work. Um, and so there's always going to be that piece. But she was like, I, I, I can affect change more thoroughly if I'm teaching the subject. And I was like, you're right about that. So, so I definitely, I, it, it was one of the things that I really took in. And um, I just want to um, say her name, Denise Boston, who was our first um, Dean of, uh, of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion here 
at C I I I S. She had the first office at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she was basically like, you affect many more people if you can train the therapists. And um, so yes. <laughs> Talking to more people than just one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were saying joy and activism, and there's got to be a reason that people keep coming back. You know, sometimes that's con- uh, connections, community, but you know, when there is something that brings joy, like I want to show up for you. Um, if it's always just hard, like already existing is hard, but if we're going to do something that is joyful, like I also and fun. Yeah. Like fun. I want to be there. I want to do that thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I fully agree. And yeah, I feel like, you know, leaving the house every day is an act of rebellion. And sometimes I just want to have fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And in this book, I wanted it to be a fun read. Um, and it and, is. Well, it people is. are trying to say, you know, it's hard. It's fun when in the early marketing. But I'm like, I don't I don't think it's hard. I I think it's funny. I'm laughing at myself reading my own book, not even at the book. I'm laughing at myself at this, yeah, in this book. Yeah. And I think what's also fun about it is um, just the storytelling aspect, just going back to that uh, a little bit, the storytelling aspect, I'm always riveted when I get a chance to hear people's stories and really like understand like what, people's lives are like Mm -hmm. um and to for me I think one of the biggest um aha moments and I think we talked about this in our call because I I just was like I didn't know that people um engaged in restriction behaviors in order to fit in because I have never fit in anywhere. Like I can't because of my height. I wear a size 12 shoe. Like there was just nothing Mm -hmm. that was ever going to allow me to fit anywhere. So I just didn't even ever think that I could do something about my body to, to restrict it to, in order to fit in. And I was like, oh my goodness, people are really, you know, um, This system creates conditions Mm -hmm. that make people desperate. Yes. To survive. To survive, thank you, to survive, to have, um, you know, careers, Mm -hmm. to find success, to find friendship, to find love. You talk about that in the book a lot, like, you know, that people are restricting so that they can, you know, look a particular way so that they can find love. So it's like, this system is embedded into everything. And the more you like pull the string and unravel it, it's like, oh my God, I can breathe. (laughs) So reading some of the stories I would, or the narratives I would be reading and I'm like, holding my breath and holding my body because I'm like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. You know? mm-hmm. I do. Uh, Lexi's story is one of them. And a really good example of, you know, so she didn't know she had an eating disorder until she had to meet me. <laughs> and it was not under clinical circumstances. It was because um, I was mentoring or supporting her. And but she just thought it was normal. Like, you know, purging and cleanses and stuff like that. Like that's just what she needed to do to win as a gymnast. It, yeah, it was the con- conforming. It wasn't like I'm intentionally going to restrict in order to be thin. No, it was just like a tactic. Yeah, yeah. And you hear about that in um, you know careers mm-hmm. that um, that really highlight what the body looks like. You know, yeah. um, but that you know, again, it's everywhere, Mm -hmm. you know, it's in order to gain love from a parent or, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To in within a family unit, for sure. Getting attention or, you know, people always bring up, you know, when I go home to see my grandmother or I have to go home to see my parents, you know, the first thing they always comment on is my weight. And then, you know, and then things spiral from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So families, Stop doing that. <laughs> Stop doing that. Do not 
start the conversation with the an assessment of you know what someone looks like mm -hmm. please don't save save your relationship <laughs> Yes. So I think we're at that point where we could um, start taking some questions. Are we there? Are we there yet? Okay. Okay. Here we go. Imagining a potentially beautiful future. What does wellness, health, capital H, small H, look like to you for Black folks and beyond? Who's asking this question? <laughs> really? <laughs> um, there are folks who do a really great job at world building. Um, so I will say that I am more of a show the cracks in the, in the system in the first mm -hmm. place. My imagination is not as vast as those. So I always feel like I'm taking down the, the, let's see, the veneer or like crashing it so that folks can see. Um, if I had my dream, uh, their capital H health, so there wouldn't be a medical industrial complex that, you know, was inventing diseases only to sell drugs to cure them, uh, which is happening right now with our weight loss drugs. Um, let's see. There wouldn't be a difference between capital H and lower H health mm. what you present to your medical provider is what it is is what it is it. it's believable mm -hmm. it's you yeah. it's just accepted and you work from that point yeah like yes. what you have is what is mm -hmm. I'm never having to advocate for myself or like make you believe me or like prove my humanity here we're just able and it would be free there we'll just throw that in there yes yeah. that is a a beautiful future. yeah and then <laughs> capital w wellness would be well-being so that was you know i didn't have mm -hmm. like lowercase wellness as much mm -hmm. as it was like well-being mm -hmm. and that's open to everyone you know we try and define it like your spiritual your financial well like what is financial wellness your wellness your eight spheres i think um it would be again self-defined financial does that just mean i get more money because i feel like that's what financial wellness would be, you know <laughs> I don't know. So your well-being would be yours and whatever it is again that makes mm -hmm. you well. Yeah. 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 Um, I actually love this next question. How can masculine or non-black people or therapists support black femmes health and wellness? Such a broad question. Yes. I really feel like I need to answer it in community. And I'm side eyeing somebody who I'm sure could help uh, mm -hmm. both you and Shana, but um, <laughs> how can it would support health and wellness or what was it? Yeah, and specifically talking about folks who are masculine or non-Black, um, support Black Femmes health and wellness. And I think maybe you just answered it, believing. There's believing. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in this society, we have to fund. So, you Indeed. know, yeah, funding mental Always. health, <laughs> funding mental uh, health, you know, nonprofits, funding, you know, uh, physical health nonprofits, uh, paying for your friend's therapy. Um, yes. And I would say just individually being there again and believing, I find that happens or it doesn't happen sometimes, like somebody not believing what I am experiencing at a doctor's office or somewhere else or needing to explain it or trying to problem solve it. That happens a lot. Yeah. You know, how can we make this better? And I'm like, no, I just told you this exists because of society and its structures. We can't, we can't solve this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what other, I'm sure you have good answers too. You know, having conversations with the people around you, like your family members. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. Being yeah. the one to have the conversation so we don't have to have the conversation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Engage that conversation. Have the conversation. With, your, with all your people. Um, <laughs> funding research on about Black women um, being the people. Yes. Wait, to, let's just oh. pause and take a breath <laughs> with that. A joyful breath. Funding research about Black women, initiated by Black women, led by Black women, funded by whoever. 
Yeah, fine. Okay. Take the money. I don't care where the money comes. Well, actually, I do. <laughs> Some legit places, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, literally, you know, I, and I really feel it's that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, funding healing centers, retreats. I think. Rick healing centers and retreats with like child care yeah, or one. dependent care where there's enough food i just want to say some good retreats. food oh can we talk about quinoa and kale girl I forgot okay is it is there a question in there no but we're but we're gonna okay. stop so we can talk about quinoa and kale go ahead <laughs> uh bay area is a very special place uh, with very special roots in um, the dirt and very particular values when it comes to food. Uh, what is food and what is not food uh, is something that exists here. Rainbow Grocery um, is always sticks out in, in my mind as what is food and like where food should come from. Um, and then anything that is not quinoa and kale anything that's not a whole grain anything that's not a leafy green like people I don't know when kale became something in my smoothie versus on the salad bar sizzler what you know the salad bar you know it lined you know yeah pizza hut was actually the people like had the highest amount of kale purchased because it lined the salad I remember that day. I remember that yeah yes yes girl Right. And then all of a sudden it's in every smoothie that ever existed. I don't know how that happened. Yeah. Um, it takes my mother to talk about that. She's like, and now collard greens are out. The, they're not even affordable anymore. Right. And we make burritos out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Basically the food policing that happens in the Bay Area is unreal. Uh, the values and morality placed on food here is bananas um eating uh that's another like capital h health situation mm -hmm. yeah you eat in the right way and all of those like the judgy like that's not real food stuff that is wild and then everything mm -hmm. okay but yeah okay <laughs> all right okay what is Ooh, I like this one. I'm going to skip around. What is the impact of aging on health and wellness for Black women? The impact of aging? Mm -hmm. I mean, outside of capital H health? Or? Um, it, this one is spelled with a small H, so I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm wondering if they, if I mean, if you want to write I, in. I think one. mostly what people want to uh, talk about is like, you know, aging in okay. general as a black woman okay. and the ways in which you know it just ups the ante okay like actual aging and health yes yeah. okay I'm like, yeah um i it's interesting to me to see how aging has become more and more i feel of a disability um generally but ups the ante right because um Black folks, poor folks, brown folks, a lot of us have, you know, just shorter lifespans because of health disparities, racism and white supremacy and colonialism. Um, and I feel like our bodies just become a like louder ticking time bomb when we get to the doctor's office. You know, people start talking about, you know, death earlier and earlier. I feel, well, in Mia's case, they were talking to her about basically the diseases she would get and she was 20 and thinking about death and putting off as long as possible. But I feel like as we get older and it's earlier than others, you know, we're pre-diabetic if we don't have diabetes. I mean, everybody who doesn't have diabetes is pre-diabetic, <laughs> but you know, for us, we just become closer and closer mm -hmm. earlier and earlier and have to think about death younger and younger when we're not there. Yeah. Um, I didn't, maybe people wanted like specifics but i mean these questions are the impact, going to um the impacts of racism continue to stack up and you know inherently that increases our blood pressure and leads to heart disease like yeah 
this this next question is also one of those multiple um questions in one okay. okay i don't feel like i'm doing a good job at this because it could <laughs> so there's so many answers we don't know my answer okay go ahead i mean because you could you could talk about each of these for a long time so what are ways that health providers and or therapists can dismantle their own internalized racism and phobia so that they don't perpetuate oppressive ideologies with their clients those so is that possible to fully dismantle that, but no it is um well no it's not that that's how system structures work right Mm-hmm. like fully dismantling white supremacy in oneself I think there are steps and you know there's lots of anti-racism you know interventions and trainings that one can go to but to fully um and you're the therapist I'm probably you teach these things what do y'all do you know from my perspective I feel like it's about um recognizing it first like that's the thing that a lot of it is invisibilized when you are part of the majority, right? So you don't see it. You don't recognize when something that you have internalized and think it, you know, is everyone's experience is not. So it really takes a lot of um, internal work to be able to um, understand your own personal social location, I think. And in understanding your social location, it's about also then recognizing that other people have, like for point for point, um, like area for area, people have a myriad, like literally a spectrum of differences. Like, okay, I am, you know, uh, a person who, what? What's an experience that I have? Um, I have a, a PhD, let's say. Um, if you are someone who's grown up in a family where everybody goes to school, everybody has a PhD, everyone that you know, because you're around all of these PhDs, you, you just grow up thinking a particular way. So then you don't recognize necessarily the struggles that someone may have in um, adapting to an academic environment, um, in uh, being able to write or research in a particular way that fits within um, the systems that we have created, right? And so you have to be able to recognize that your experience is is going to be different or opposite from other people's. That was amazing. I like that answer. I was going to say that, you know, initially for my scientific and maybe this helped for the medical like folks in my unraveling of weight stigma and anti-fatness was initially to do the researchy bits, which, you know, were the, like, we need white papers to prove that fat people can be healthy. I don't like that but oftentimes that is like the way in and it was for me that was 10 years ago and then with that it was like humanity and noticing humanity um I started volunteering for fat liberation events like doing the labor and then being around a bunch of joyful you know fat folks and it was like oh you know it just becomes you know as you're doing this work it really to me is about seeing the person Mm -hmm. and like not seeing the narratives that have been like written about that person paying attention like the people and paying people attention becoming... to people yeah and like slowing down and being yeah. curious about why you think the way you think how to think how you think the way that you think yeah. oh um can we shout out um Sonia Renee Taylor's yes, book spoken word person as well as you that's <laughs> what I was listening for yes because she does a really good job in um what is the name of that book please tell me somebody the body is not an yeah, apology. The body is not an apology. She does a really good job in that book of helping people slow down and really do a self-assessment. So I feel like that is, that's my answer. That's for good. This one. And I think that what happens here in the be curious piece is people are often then curious about you. And I'm like, mm. tell tell me, you know, and then all of the, I want to understand from you versus like what, exactly what you said, like being curious in me what is making me like have these thoughts or these responses to this person yeah Yeah, so that type of curious you said it thank you yeah it was good
I like the collaboration on these answers. <laughs> I'm glad. I feel it's like it's a village to yeah, answer a no, question. I'm like, this is what I did, but what do people like? What's the academic way to say that? I don't know. You did great. <laughs> okay. This is one specifically for you, so I can't help you with this one. Fine. Okay. Yeah. You got it? We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> Why, while writing your book, what was one thing that really surprised you? Um, a few things. One that I think is a good one to highlight is that, you know, I started writing this book for all black women and I had to really reckon with my internalized respectability. And when I said all black women, I really meant all black women. And so there was, if there was any bit or part of me that was, you know, engaging in my own, you know, respectability about, mm -hmm. you know, how, mm -hmm. you know, black women should behave or, you know, how, you know, maybe in this case is it's okay type of stuff like maybe we should be you know not policing but like you know adjusting or you know managing people I was like oh no no that's that's not that's not what we're doing here so yeah really getting the point where I'm there for all black women not just certain I love the um the part where you were talking about um the the um, I guess live stream or whatever that um, the comedian Monique did Ooh. and she was talking about yeah. you know wearing bonnets outside yeah and, all that. That, yeah. and then you asked her dad about it mm -hmm. and I, I was like that was a diplomatic response dad <laughs> <laughs> he's great um, so the video was Monique telling yes black women uh, who are queens in training there are queens who know not to wear leggings um, or pajamas or slippers outside of the house or bonnets. And then there's the other black women, um, which is just wild. But yeah, my dad responded. I made him watch it. He's born in the 1940s and so really embedded in, oh, in the South. So had a lot, like yeah. Black conservatism. Baptist like church. Yeah. So I was like, dad, what do you, what, just generally, what do you think about this video? <laughs> it's like, well, she didn't like it. You know, it's like, oh, okay. But then, you know, yes, he ended up talking about how um, we got into, you know, conversations about um, sagging pants and the ways that Black folks dress today and how he thinks it's um, a form of protest against what is, you know, expected of Black folks. And he said, yeah, because, you know, young Black folks saw us trying to conform and that, you know, we weren't actually treated any better. So we're just doing what they're doing today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is one um, thing that I want to mention here that I feel like is a, is a joyful protest. If you haven't seen it already, um, P Valley. Yeah. Whew, that is a Black joyful protest for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, just be ready. It's great. <laughs> and I love it. I love that they, they show up, um, they have the characters and, um, what's her name? Katori Hall, or I, I can't remember, her, um, her last name, but the, but the writer, the creator of the show, I feel like really does a great job in allowing, not just allowing, but showcasing black people in all forms in this show unapologetically joyfully um and it's it's a fantastic show so if you get a chance um okay last question so excited to read your book are there other resources books podcasts other media that you will recommend thank you for this offering great and this can be crowdsourced so you already mentioned Sonia Renee Taylor's book the yeah. body is not an apology I mentioned earlier Sabrina Strings fearing the black body um the racial origins of fat phobia Deshaun Harrison has oh here's my memory belly of the beast uh, who takes uh, Sabrina Strings work even a bit further and really talks about um fat phobia from a trans mask person uh perspective I mentioned Nicole Byers book 
in here as a really great example of Black Joy. Um, it's more of a picture book. It's her in 100 different bikinis around LA um, and having, you know, turning a uh, very fat, very brave, you know, like on its head, like I'm so brave, you know, being a fat Black woman in a bikini in like this scenario because mm -hmm. yes. So turning, you know, I'm not brave. I'm just having fun yes. as a fat Black woman. Yes. Um, that one I found have been really helpful. Uh, other mediums and podcasts. I ran no in general. Oh, all the time. <laughs> uh, Lizzo was great. And noticing what comes up for people when they see Lizzo, are they looking to Lizzo as their body positive beacon? Or are you just appreciating Lizzo for being rad and black? And, and playing the flute. I know. Damn it. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> what, what's happening for you in this moment? So <laughs> yes, Lizzo help out. Uh, no lose is great. Um, it's a red fat liberationist org where I stink at the resource, uh, platforms. Help me out people. Hmm? I ran a limited podcast about black folks and eating disorders with, uh, for Rhea Tariq, it was 10 ish episodes. And if folks are looking for the perspectives of fat black folks with eating disorders it's amazing highly recommend mm -hmm. um my black body podcast people locally i yeah. just want to shout out another organization yeah. that i work with uh, rafiki coalition yeah. they are amazingly like um creating some of the most joyful and um like well like actual like well-being wellness um events all over the city and um you know really focusing on uh the people who have access to it the least so like if you are black or a person of color you want to go get some massage acupuncture you know healthy eating dance classes yoga go go hit up Rafiki for real okay. like they're doing amazing stuff and doing it full free for the community yes I just remembered two more books Clarkisha Kent just had fat off fat on come out and Chrissy King comes out with the body liberation project in a week or so so I got those books in my head are we good <laughs> Yeah, Thanks everybody for coming out and witnessing um, our conversation. Um, really appreciate your presence, your time, your energy. Thank you, Jessica. You're welcome. This was amazing. <laughs> I'm so glad I got to be in conversation. Yes. Yeah. And in community. Because yes. that's where it happens. In community. Yeah. Always in community. Thanks everybody. Have a good evening. Thank mm -hmm. you.